You're listening to Northwoods Church Matters, a podcast of Northwoods Church in Evansville, Indiana, where we discuss why the local church matters and things that matter to the local church. I'm your host, Matt Higgins. Hey, well, welcome back to the Northwoods Church Matters podcast. I'm here with my friend Nathan. Hello. Hey, and we're here to talk about a more lighthearted topic today, I guess, which is many of us grew up listening to Christian music. Oh, yeah. Especially the 80s and the 90s. That music was beyond belief, (laughs) beyond belief. (laughs) I know that reference. (laughs) Yeah, I was talking to somebody yesterday about Petra, and they're like, I have no idea. It was somebody in their 20s. I used to have cassette tapes of Petra. That's the era that I come from. That was my first foray into Christian music was a Petra cassette that an evangelist gave me. And like I said, I'd never listened to Christian music before. And they're like, you got to listen to this. <laughs> and it was the weirdest thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I couldn't stop listening uh, to it. I thought they were pretty cool. I don't know how they hold up. I haven't listened to them forever, but. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, now going back and listening to some of the 70s stuff, it's not awesome. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go back and listen to the coloring song. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, let's get into it. Let's talk about some Christian music today. Okay. Well, number one, why was Christian music so huge in the 80s and the 90s? Well, I think the first thing we can talk about is just God and revival. Mm -hmm. I think that God used popular music to bring revival in the church. I highly encourage people to go out and watch the documentary, The Jesus Music. It does a good job, but there's just so much there that you can't get into everything in a two-hour movie. But, you know, in the 60s, you had this kickoff of uh, contemporary Christian music out on the West Coast, and the revivals happening out there. People were taking hippie music and popular music and putting Jesus lyrics to it, and it was just this new thing, and it just spread like wildfire. But it never was really accepted in the church as church music. But right off the bat, God is supernaturally doing something through this music. Like the number of people that have been saved or had a great spiritual moment or have been taught a life lesson through the music that was produced during all of these eras has just been great for the kingdom of God. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, And so let's not underestimate God using this for his glory. But I think the thing that happened really in the 80s is you really had a generation of people that were listening to Jesus music back in the 60s and the 70s And all of a sudden, these people grow up and they have buying power. And so they're going to go out and buy the music they're accustomed to. And as kids mature into adults and actually have spending power, all of this stuff gets bought. The thing that goes along with it is just for a while, especially in the 70s, when all this new Christian music started going out, there are a lot of people in the church that were highly opposed to it, Mm -hmm. like the, the Jimmy Swaggerts of the world having a crusade against rock and roll music because it was the devil's music. Right. Kind of the whole satanic panic thing that was happening around the same time. Sure, that, yeah. uh, you play a record backwards from a rock and roll artist and you're going to get secret messages about suicide mm. and, and alcoholism and taking drugs and all this stuff. And there was always this feeling like the rock and roll was the devil's music. And then in the 80s and the 90s, you have an easing of that feeling. Right. The people that grew up with it are just like, oh, I guess this is okay. The thing that goes along with it is back in the 60s, there really wasn't a lot of money in Christian music because it was considered evil by a lot of churches, not allowed in the church. And so then the other thing behind the scenes is just that culture was more religious and more Christian during this time. The religious right was definitely on the forefront Mm -hmm. and churches were trying to make a conscious impact in culture. And so you see a lot of Christian music and a lot of people trying to be evangelists out there through music. I also just feel like in the 80s, there's this pushback against the sort of countercultural rebellion against Christianity and against conservative values that began in the 60s with the sexual revolution, Woodstock, all that wonderful stuff. Mm-hmm. And you have that through the 70s. And then somewhere in the 80s, there's just a push towards conservative values with Ronald Reagan, with all this kind of stuff. And some of it's good, some of it's bad. We could spend many, many podcasts mm-hmm. talking about it. The yeah. point was there was a resurgence of what you might call Christian values in popular culture around that. I mean, that's the era of Jim Dobson, a focus on the family, yeah. of of all that kind of stuff. Yeah. In some lingering elements from the 60s, Campus Crusade for Christ, mm-hmm. 
Chuck Smith and all these things that just had a lingering influence that was there. Let me just put out there as well, in the 80s, there were just a lot of great musicians, too. Even in the 70s, too. I mean, these guys were just great musicians. Phil Kage still is a masterful guitar player. Keith Green was just a musical whiz. And even Amy Grant or Michael W. Smith, just great musicians Mm -hmm. that were putting out high quality level of music. And so... I mean, just in preparing for this, I was, I had all this Amy Grant stuff going through my head. (laughs) Come on, praise to the Lord. Lord, (laughs) (laughs) She's a fantastic musician. And Keith Green was really cutting edge, like almost prog rock kind of stuff. These people were no slouches. I think sometimes maybe if someone's not as acquainted with the scene, they might think, well, some of these people... They just took what the pagans did and slapped some Jesus lyrics on it. And Mm -hmm. that wasn't necessarily true. Some of these people were really on the forefront of what was cool and interesting and musically innovative at the time. Yeah. And a lot of these guys, they're going from church to church or bar to bar or just wherever they could play. And it wasn't a lot of light shows or things like that or smoke machines or things like that. These guys had to be engaging with the crowd Mm -hmm. and entertaining. And so you go back and watch a film of Keith Green or Rich Mullins or any of these people from this era. They intentionally had to be very engaging with the crowd in order to reel people in because they didn't have a lot of the effects stuff that other people had. Right. There's just a natural vibe from that as well. Now, where when does CCM actually become a thing, a brand, a... Is that in the 80s? Yeah, it's really in the 80s. In the 60s, 70s, it really was the Jesus music type of movement was what it was known for. And then in the 80s, as Christian music becomes more corporatized, then you start to see it being called contemporary Christian music. Of course, there's the CCM magazine, which I I think is really the impetus of Mm. this for calling it CCM. But as it's consolidated and monetized and becomes a big industry, it's almost like you can see the music becoming streamlined in terms of what was acceptable in terms of Christian music. And all of these different artists, to some extent, have the same vibe Mm -hmm. in the 80s. Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant and all the artists that were during that similar time frame, they all have the kind of the same vibe of Mm -hmm. what is acceptable. And and, and when did Amy Grant go, uh, uh, oh, baby, baby? I think that was in the 90s. Was that in the 90s? Yeah. uh, There was a big push in the 90s of trying to break out of CCM and just the religious market and break into the more secular markets. And I think a lot of that was for a, a good reason. It wasn't just to sell more records. It was... Genuinely, a lot of these artists, they really wanted to make an impact for Christ in popular culture. And so there was a lot of cries of sellout for Amy Grant or Michael W. Smith when they started putting out what were considered secular records and writing about romance and love and not necessarily uh, music about Jesus, although it was not like they were writing about pornographic things or, or anything like that. But People, some people just didn't get it. Like, mm-hmm. why are you writing music for people other than the church? But maybe you know, because we need to reach people. Ma- exactly. <laughs> people exactly. In the yeah. And I think that people were reached through that. So to God be the glory. Yeah. 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 I watched the music video. I went down all kinds of fun rabbit holes in prepping for this, but I watched the music video for Oh Baby Baby yesterday. She, you know, she's like feeding spaghetti to her boyfriend. <laughs> really salacious stuff. Right? right. It's like if they put Lady in the Tramp into yeah, really, music video it really, format. It really is. <laughs> well, okay. So in contemporary Christian music's heyday, approximately 50 million CCM records were sold per year. In 2014, that number dropped to about 17 million, and today it's hard to track those numbers because how we consume music has changed, but it's clear that the Christian music industry has declined since its heyday. Why has that decline occurred? Well, I think there's a couple different reasons there. I think on a spiritual level, you see the decline of Christian culture, and you see that in a lot of different trends. I think the clearest one to see is this trend of the rise of the nuns, which is the fastest growing segment of the American population in terms of religious values is people that say they have no religious preference, meaning they're not even atheists or agnostic, meaning they just don't have any consideration of the religious whatsoever. Right. In 2022, the nuns were 21% of America, and that doesn't even count agnostics or 
atheists, mm -hmm. and you push that up there, it, it's significantly more. And so you see this trend of America becoming less Christian on a statistical level. So there's just fewer people to consume Christian music that's out there. Another reason is just oversaturation. The impact of the 80s was that these companies just started making a lot of money mm -hmm. in Christian music. And so they started in the 90s trying to pump out as much Christian music as they possibly could. And so you see record companies trying to snag up any sort of band that had a mildly religious type of angle to it mm -hmm. and putting them on a Christian record label. And suddenly the market is oversaturated because you have so many options and so many bands and there's only so many places your money can go. And let's just be honest, a lot of them, there's a good amount of Christian music in the 90s, which was just junk. Just throw away CDs that are in the landfill right now because nobody really listened to those bands. Mm -hmm. And it's just an oversaturation of the market. Right. Which, by the way, what you just described is not a unique to Christians phenomena. You just described the rise and fall of disco. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, well, that's what happens. Something becomes popular. The money men come in and say, ah, let's make as much of this. We got a surefire thing. And then they oversaturate the market and it falls off. That's just that you, that happens in movie trends. It looks like it's happening with superhero movies right now. It happens in all kinds of places in popular culture. It's just, yeah, it's just what it is in terms of the way that consumer markets and capitalism works. Mm -hmm. Like if you see the scrub daddy makes lots of money, everybody's going to start producing lots of scrub daddies right. and, and knockoff brands of that. It just AirPods become popular. And then you see now there's a million different knockoffs of AirPods. Why right. do I want to buy Apple's $99 AirPods when I can buy a knockoff for 10 bucks? And so this is just the way the, the market works. But I think the thing that's a lingering impact from the 90s is really come out now today that some of the record labels were really unscrupulous. And knowing that some of these bands that were being signed really weren't solid Christian bands, mm -hmm. but they were being marketed that way right. in order to get numbers. And that really is a shame. And that's why you see a lot of bands from the 90s now coming out and say, yeah, we really weren't a major Christian band. We never really were Christians. They just hired us and signed us to a record label because that's what they were doing there. Yeah, the, one of the phenomenons that you'll see across popular music is that it's easier to be a big fish in a small pond. And so often people will start in more ghetto genres, so to speak. Even somebody as huge, like the biggest star of the world, not just music, but just the biggest star of the world right now is Taylor Swift. Yeah. She started as a country star, which is not nearly as big as pop mm -hmm. in terms of its impact, but that's a smaller arena that somebody like that can come up in and make a splash in and then at a certain point they can jump into the bigger and, and so it's very easy at its worst what has happened with christian music is it's like well these guys might not make an impact if we tried to just throw them into the top 40 billboard whatever immediately but maybe they can make a splash over in the christian ghetto yeah yeah and it got confusing back in the 90s and even the aughts where you have bands coming out and saying we're not a Christian band. We're Christians who make music. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. What does that mean? Uh -huh. Okay. I'm not sure what that distinction even means right. today. <laughs> <laughs> People still say it, though. People still say it. A couple things that I haven't mentioned is just one, the rise of online music. I remember when Napster yeah. first came out. I used that. LimeWire mm -hmm. used that a ton. And suddenly I could get music for free yeah. instead of going to the record store and buying it. And then downloads and then streaming and it's gotten to the point where music consumption has just radically changed i mean it, it totally upended the entire music industry right. not just the christian music industry and if people don't know the amount that actually goes to artists on each stream of a song on either spotify or itunes is just abysmal i think from my music that i have on spotify i think it's 0 0.02 cents per play a fraction of a cent every time somebody plays a song, which is awful. It's just, I don't understand how bands make it. And then another thing to consider is Amazon killed the traditional bookstore. Right. There used to be these places that were just wonderful where people would just go hang out and 
there's a Christian coffee bar and there's books and you could go see what the latest stuff was. And it was this whole subculture. And when Amazon came out, those places just died. Well, and if you were in a larger town or a Christian town, you'd have a Christian bookstore. And yeah. I just, you don't see a lot of Christian bookstores anymore. No, thank God we still have one here in, in Evansville, Indiana. It's mm -hmm. a good one. So shout out to the vineyard. But how they've done business has had to change and roll with the punches. Thank goodness they're still open, but it's a struggle to keep those doors open. Well, why has Christian music shifted towards worship music for the church? Well, I think the demand for new music in the church has reflected popular music trends. And you just have people that want to see their style of music in the church. And I think one of the interesting things that happened was in the 60s and the 70s, as we mentioned, there was lots of pushback from the church in terms of, is this music, this rock and roll music, the devil's music, is it really acceptable to be played in church? Right. And then by the 90s, again, you have this group of people that grew up with Jesus music and CCM music, and they're like, well, why can't we have this stuff in the church? And then we enter into a phase in the 90s and the aughts of worship wars, where people that grew up with CCM and Jesus music, they're like, we want to hear this stuff in church. We want to have worship songs with more of a band and a rock and roll tinge to it, and let's go ahead and change worship styles. And so that really drove the rise of worship music that before the 90s and the aughts, there was no demand for it because people thought that rock and roll shouldn't be played in church. And now it's just a ubiquitous thing. The worship wars have been won by the more rock and roll style of music. Yeah, I was part of a church growing up that we had an old lady playing a piano and we'd sing hymns and a lot of people knew the four-part harmonies. And at a certain point, the elders of that church determined we want to love our neighbors. We want to make people feel invited. And a lot of people don't know these harmonies and don't know these old hymns anymore. So we're going to move towards a more modern direction. And it was a big deal. It was a fight. It mm -hmm. was like, I think we lost people. Like it was some pretty dorky stuff, actually. It was like Shine Jesus Shine kind of the old red Maranatha praise books yeah. kind of stuff that we moved to first. And I think we had a guitar without drums. Mm -hmm. And that was a thing. And there were some people that were really offended just by a guitar. And then drums came. Yeah. And that was... That was a big that deal. That was a big deal. And it's just... If you were to take a time machine and go back and listen to what seemed so challenging to people at the time, you you might, depending on what background you come from, be like, that? That, that sound? Like, that was the thing that was so offensive? That's about as conservative sounding now as you could get, but... It yeah, just, I, just goes to show how times change. Yeah, I think one interesting scene from the Jesus Music documentary was it was talking about Calvary Chapel out in California, where really the epicenter of the Jesus Music thing. And when Love Song, which was one of the original Jesus Music bands, asked the leadership of Calvary Chapel, can they play? They were really hesitant because it was still, even though they were gathering in the hippies and the free love people and some of the counterculture people into the church, the music had always been pianos, organs, choirs, and still was. And it was a radical shift. And another interesting element from the documentary, the advent of Billy Graham accepting Christian music or CCM music was a big deal. That there was a big youth rally in 72, Explo 72, and Billy Graham was there. and. He embraced it and encouraged those bands to come out and support him as he preached. And that was a major turning point where somebody of the nature and the caliber of Billy Graham coming out and saying, this is a real thing. But even with that, churches resisted it for years. And I remember those type of worship wars, too. I actually, my friend has a story of his great grandmother's church, or maybe it was his great great grandmother. I don't know exactly when, but their church did acapella singing and at a certain point they decided they were going to buy and install an organ and they had the same fight that we're describing where everyone was like ah this newfangled organ <laughs> music new it'll never <laughs> you and, kids and your organ <laughs> and organs were expensive right <laughs> goodness gracious yeah so it's like you can go back hundreds of years and you can find the same dynamic where, yeah. where there's people that have ways that they like to do things and then there's younger people that have different ways that they like to do things, and it can cause, unfortunately, 
big fights in the church? Yeah, I remember growing up, we were a church with an organ and choir and the traditional sound of music, and we wouldn't play Southern gospel music because our music minister said it originated from bar music, and therefore, because of its origination, we aren't going to play Southern gospel music. Right. I, I, even today, I find that interesting about we were in a traditional church and you couldn't even play There's Power in the Blood. That yeah, it wasn't an appropriate song to play. Yeah, and to my mind, those songs seem so not old fashioned. I love those songs, but I would never think that they were anything but just church music. And music changes even today. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the production and recording right now is minimalism. Let's do a recording and subtract everything that takes away from the melody of the song. If you listen to Midnights by Taylor Swift, that's a perfect example of minimalism. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a drum track, Taylor Swift's vocal, and maybe a synthesizer. That's it. And I think worship music and a lot of music is moving towards that direction of minimalism where there's just not going to be a lot of instrumentation. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Let me throw out there before we get any further. Northwoods and I am not anti-hymn. Right. So don't take that away. I think hymns are great. We do hymns all the time. I don't think we should throw the baby out in the bathwater. But can we arrange things? so that they sound a little more fresh and modern? Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. Let's do it. Let's not get rid of hymns, but let's make sure that they sound relevant and modern, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You're making me think of the worship war that happened during the Reformation when Martin Luther and John Calvin and all these guys started reforming what was at the time the Roman Catholic Church, and there was such high church music choral sort of the things that we think of as sort of monks monk song and stuff like that that the people could not sing and what a lot of those guys did martin luther wrote for example a mighty fortress is our god Mm -hmm. which is just him taking a folk melody of the time and putting some words to it and that was scandalous in its way a lot of the things that we think of as the stodgiest of old hymns are actually those guys taking what was popular and what was accessible and what like a A dock worker would have been humming to himself at the time and just putting some words to it. So I always think it's hilarious when people in the church say, let's play some old hymns. And then you pull out a mighty fortresses or God and people are like, what is that? Right. (laughs) Well, it's probably the oldest hymn in the hymn. Right. (laughs) (laughs) It's an old hymn. It's an old Old hymn. hymn. Thanks for tuning in to the Northwoods Church Matters podcast. If you'd like to find out more about Northwoods Church, you can visit us at our website, www.northwoodschurch.org. Again, that's www.northwoodschurch.org.